Jesus' name? Oh, yes. We come, O oh Lord, with our hearts full of thanksgiving. Oh, yes. Thank you. Father, you've allowed us to see one more day. Yes, yes, yes. Bless them. 
earth stand silent before him. Please repeat after me. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him for the sounds of the trumpet. And praise him for the psaltery and harp. Praise him for the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the thimble and dance. Praise him with the thimble and dance. Praise him with the string instruments and organs. Praise him with the string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals.
by Deacon Dennis Dowder and Duncan. Come on, we'll give God some praise. Amen. Amen. 
miracle on the 12th. Amen. Praise God. Those are special people. Amen. Born in a special month. <laughs> we're thankful. We're thankful. Um, and so, and then remember all the sick and the shut in. Don't forget um, our trip to Louisville, Kentucky. Those who want to go, we're going to try to um, leave on Friday and um, come back on a Sunday. On um, that Saturday, we'd like to introduce you to uh, the Muhammad Ali Museum if you haven't been already. It's a great museum. Louisville Slug Museum is there as well. The city is full of museums, but Muhammad Ali is one of my favorites. And, um, uh, we'd love, love to take you um, to, to the Muhammad Ali Museum. Um, so, remember all the other things that we have coming up um, in, the, uh, in the calendar, and we look forward to those things. And we're going to uh, move forward now in our, in our uh, worship service. It is a little warm today. Uh, that's, that's one of the things we need to talk to you about. So, um, we're going to move forward in our worship service. God bless you, and may God keep you.
this season, don't pass anybody. Amen. Amen. We're going to now have a scripture reading this morning, which will come from 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses 5 through 7. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand, giving on to the reading of the word of God, and if you'd rather not stand, please just remain seated where you are. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Amen. Amen. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And it reads, besides this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temper. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Amen. 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 May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of this holy word. Amen. Amen. Us in our hymn of meditation, amen. The musicians play softly, let us prepare our hearts.
Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's the highest praise. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God.
God bless you. Sit with the mic to the light. Run out of gas there. Amen. We are going to have a selection for the choir. Then I'm going to ask my cousin to come and introduce himself. And if you would, sing Bomb and Gilead as I'm, as I'm pushed off to preach. Amen. 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 Amen.
time, I'm really an old fashioned deacon. I wear a suit to church. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they got me. I wore my only suit last night to the family reunion. And I don't like to repeat because it might be smelling. So I just wore what was clean in the closet. But I have to tell you something before I sing for you. <clears throat> this family reunion has been a good family reunion over the years. Uh, Reverend Dr. C.L. Jordan, we met for the first time last night. But it was missing one thing. Church. All the years I've been coming to this family reunion, my, my wife passed from lung cancer three years ago, four years ago. And um, so, but all the times I was coming, I kept saying, why is it we don't end this family reunion at a church somewhere? So my wife has passed. Here you come, Reverend Dr. C.L. Jordan. He says, this is the first time I've been able to catch up with this reunion. I said, well, to myself, I said, uh-huh. He's the one. Next time they have this family reunion down here, Dr. Jordan, make sure all them Negroes come to you. I'm not kidding you. Because I talked about him this morning at breakfast. I said, I'm going to, to Dr. George's church, your church. <laughs> so I didn't you know, but I'm glad to be here. And I was glad to be here last night. You know, in my families, on my uh, mother's side and father's side, North Carolina and Virginia, we always make sure we have church at the end of the union. Yeah. That's what it's really all about. Did we come out of there? Yeah. That's where we came from. So we can't forget that, you know. So I'm an international opera singer, that's true. I've sung all over the world, but I'm a deacon in the Baptist church. And I've been a deacon in four different Baptist churches in four different states. I'm not a church opera. I'm in different places. They would ask me to be in the And I love to serve God. Now, my daughter should have been here, but she went somewhere with a friend and whatnot. So I'll give her on the plane. Because I don't play anything. But that's all right. She came through. She sang last night. And uh, she would have sung today if she had been here. My son is away uh, in Toronto. But uh, I sing for you now because I feel for you troubled times. Some of us feel good, some of us don't feel so good. Yes, sir. the 
looked at one of his old vehicles that he kept and he said, why did I hold on to this vehicle? He said, it would have bought 10 Jews if I had sold it. Picked up another possession and he said, I could have bought one more <clears throat> with this. I could have done more. Remember, we're talking about grace giving. That's our series has been on grace giving. And I want us to know that one day Jesus will come back and time will be no more. Those of us who love Jesus will be caught up in the air to meet him. And all of our 401k accounts and all of our stock projects and accounts and bank accounts and cars and houses will be no more. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. However, we know, we say this around the church quite often, and we know it to be true, that only what we do for Christ will last. Yes. Yes. For some of us, it does not seem to matter now, but one day we will stand in eternity thinking, I could have done more. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I could have done more in trying to talk to someone about Jesus Christ. Yes. I could have been more, done more in presenting my body as a living sacrifice. Come on, somebody. Right. Holy and acceptable unto God. I could have done more in giving to the kingdom of God. And what I want us to know is, is that the grace giver, as we talk about grace giving, I want you to, I want to explain to you what moves and motivates the grace giver. First of all, the, the grace giver understands that, that as a believer, we are in a covenant or covenant relationship. A covenant relationship. Uh, now when you talk about covenants, covenants come in two ways. There are conditional covenants and there are unconditional covenants. A conditional covenant says, I will if you will do this, I'll do this for you. But unconditional, unconditional covenant says, I will, in spite of what you do, I will perform this on your behalf. And so, when we look at conditional covenants, the Bible says that if a man would confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in his heart that God has raised him from the dead, he shall be saved. That's a covenant. But that's a conditional covenant. That's on the condition that a man says what God already knows about. That a man or a woman says that, yes, I am a sinner. Yes, I have rejected your plan for my life. Yes, I've been my, my own guide. I've been the, the, uh, an individual where God is concerned. And, and now I understand that that no one can enter into heaven unless they come through Jesus. When a person says that, that's conditional. They receive salvation based on the fact that they realize first that they ain't always been clean. In fact, they ain't never been clean. And that is Jesus who cleans us up. An unconditional covenant we find uh, in Genesis chapter 12 where where, where the Lord says to Abraham, get up and leave your homeland. Leave where you're familiar with and leave your family. Not many of us, we talked about yesterday the diasporas of, of, of the William family and how the William family spread across uh, the United States. Uh, but, but not many folks, there are 
are some folks that don't want to leave mom. Come on, somebody. There's some folks that don't want to leave dad. There's some folks, and especially if you're telling them to go and you haven't given them a direction of where they're going. Most folks will say, if you say, come ride with me, where are we going? Everybody wants to know where are we going. Yeah. We, we want to be in control of what happens to us, right? But when God spoke to Abraham, he said to Abraham, get up and leave your daddy's place and go to the place where I will lead you. Abraham never asked God, where are we going? And God said, because of his faithfulness, he says to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. I will make you a great nation and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who will curse you. That's an unconditional covenant. Abraham didn't have to do anything. God says, because of your relationship with me, because I love you, we're in a covenant relationship. And I want you to understand about a covenant relationship. Covenant, a covenant relationship is based on the fact that there is a there are promises that are based on the relationship. And so God, when he created man, he created man in a covenant relationship. Man, I'll place you in the garden there in Eden, and all you have to do is to work the land. Take care of the animals. That's all you've got to do. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless you. You're in a relationship with me. And that's what God really desires from us today. Sin came in and screwed up, messed up. And now we have this contagious disease called sin that moves from generation to generation. But God says, I want a relationship with you. I want to be in a covenant relationship. And so God is, when we are believers, we are in a covenant relationship with God. Right. Now, the covenant, I want you to know, differs than a contract. Yes. It's the difference from, between a covenant and a contract. A contract can be torn up. Yes. A contract can be altered. Yes. But God has a covenant. <laughs> and a covenant can't be altered. Amen. A covenant can't be broken. And when we look at the Bible, we find that there are covenants, many, many covenants. I don't have time to go through all of them with you today, but I will say that during Bible study Sunday school, those are the times that you will find when we'll talk about the Abrahamic covenant with the Noahic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and all of those covenants that follow. But I want you to know that one of the very first covenants that God put together was marriage. Right. Help me somebody. Marriage was the first covenant, was one of the first covenants known to man. Yes, God took Adam and said, it's not good that man be alone. Come on, somebody. It's not good. So God made a woman for Adam. Why are up in here It's not good that man be alone. In that marriage covenant, I want you to understand something. That covenant is put together by God. Now, I want you to see something. Now, this is why a lot of people today, they try to change the marriage ceremony. Because the marriage ceremony in America is based on the word of God, the traditional one. And people try to change that covenant because of that vow, because they don't want to be attached to the Word of God. Therefore, we have people writing their own vows now. They're taking out the word obey. They're taking out the word serve and take care of and, and to death do us part. They come up with a whole lot of other things that have nothing to do with the covenant that God has established for man. And so the man and the woman are in a covenant relationship. And as Christians, Christians need to understand that. The Bible says that God hates divorce. He put some guidance on it because of the stiff-neckedness of Israel, but he hates divorce. And so 
in a marriage covenant, a man and a woman are there on a vow, they're a promise to one another, to stay with one another, to love one another through sickness and through health, through good times and bad times. I think uh, Deacon Will said this morning that, that you're going to have some bad times in your marriage. Yeah. Hello, somebody. There are going to be bad times. Yeah, there are good times. But what people don't want to deal with are the bad times. Yeah. They don't want to work through the bad times. Yeah. But marriage is a covenant. Yeah. And so we are bound to our spouse until death separates us. And then there's a family covenant, all right? The man and the woman were to be fruitful and to multiply. Yeah. And so there's a covenant with the family, the husband and the wife are to come together and share with one another. No other but one another. Hello, somebody. Ain't no third person involved in it. Or fourth, or fifth, or have. But the family is a covenant. You remember when you were growing up? And your parents, what was the one rule in your house? What goes on where? In this house does what? Stays in this house. That was a covenant. And if you broke that covenant, your parents were to break your rear end, right? I know that's the way it was in our house. What goes in this house, I don't care what's going on down the street. But whatever happens in this house, don't tell me about what, what the Joneses or somebody else is doing. And keep it in this house. It's a covenant among the family. And then the church has a covenant. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. Yeah, y'all, yeah, open up your, open up your, open up your, your program to it. And just peruse that covenant that's in the inside of your program. Now, I want to tell you something. I told the Sunday school this morning. I kind of got a but I told him this morning, the word of God says that you and I are not to make a vow before the Lord if we do not plan to keep it. We ain't supposed to do that. And I shared with the Sunday school this morning that, that I, 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 I'm almost, you know, in every church that I've been in, I have removed the reading of the covenant on first Sundays. Yeah, it's getting quiet. Right. You mess with our tradition now, Pastor, what you talked about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I am tempted to mess with the tradition because I don't want people lying in the church. Come on, somebody. Because let's just be honest, some of us are lying. Oh yeah, I told you it was going to be different than I told you the days were coming, didn't I? I don't want you to be lying about things in the church. Look at, uh, I'm trying to find it here. Look, look at where we, we, we talked about, I may have to do it back to you. Uh, uh, when we remove, let's look at this more when we engage that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other place. How in the world do people leave the church? I call him, stay gone for 15 years. Ain't been to church nowhere else. Come back to Iconium as though they're still a member. Bible says if you leave, I mean the covenant says if you leave. Well, first of all, the Bible says in 1025 of Hebrews that you should not forsake the son of yourselves together. Am I right about it? Is that what the Bible says? You can go to it and look at it, which is the custom of some. In other words, you should not be missing church. That's the custom of some folks. Okay? And in fact, that's people who don't understand who they are in Christ. All right? All right? I don't, hold on with me. Don't get bored with me. Don't get bored with me. All right? But that's a covenant where we can carry out the spirit of, the, of this covenant and the principles of God's word. How are you going to do that if you don't go to church? Amen. Right. Now, Pastor. Amen. That's what pastors are supposed to do. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly white. Love. Love. To do what? Remember each other in prayer. Prayer. Not that P-R-E-Y. Not praying on folks. But praying for folks. Alright? Don't become an predator. Alright? To aid. And everybody in here be saying amen. To aid each other in what? Sickness and in distress. 
to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and courtesy and speech. Yes. Watch how we talk to one another. Be slow to take an offense. People stop coming to church. Why? Because somebody looked at me wrong. Somebody's tone was wrong. Maybe they were having a bad day. Maybe you should go to them and talk to them about it. Ready for what? Reconciliation. So you get the thing right, right? Let's get it right. And then, where's the other part? We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion. One of our family members on yesterday was, was, was testifying to me and my brother. And she didn't know that both of us were preachers. And she was talking and we were listening. She's from South Carolina, I think it was Bobby. Um, but anyway, she, she was saying, you know, uh, we, we, we as Christians today, she said, in the church, we walk away from Jesus. She's just telling the truth. We saying amen. We don't even listen to the word. We don't even read the word. She kept going right on. She said, okay. But to seek salvation of our kindred, we don't even care what our kids go to church. I know I'm supposed to be talking about grace. But I didn't take this side off. We don't even care if our children go to church. We don't demand that they go to church. Brother said he got to talk to his daughter. But I know my parents would talk to us. To walk circumspectly in the world, to be just and ideal, to be like the chief. Faithful in our engagements and exemplary in our deportment. And to avoid what? Tattling and backbiting. Boy, there's been so much tattling and backbiting in the last few. Yeah, come on. Y'all know. <laughs> Avoiding excessive anger to abstain from the cell. Oh, Lord. This is in the Baptist government. Of the cell and the use of intoxicating drink as a beverage. Oh, Lord, you. That's what I'm going to have to turn right now. Why? Because those things, I used to work as a substance abuse counselor, so I know what alcohol will do. A lot of people say, well, alcohol is not a drug. Yes, it is the most dangerous drug that has ever been known to man. It's the most dangerous drug in the United States. It kills more people than all of the supposedly hard drugs have ever killed. It separates more families. All right? I'm not talking about alcohol. I'm just talking about the government. We're more engaged that by uh, the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church, and uh, in knowledge, and in holiness, and comfort. Some people don't even want the pastor to preach about holiness. To promote prosperity and spirituality, to sustain his worship, and ordinances, and discipline. Some folks don't want to be disciplined. And doctrines, or don't want to listen to the disciplines in the church. All of these things, we say on first Sunday, it's a covenant. What does a covenant do? It protects the church. It, 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 it reminds us that we are walking in fellowship with one another. That's what the covenant does. It says that we belong to a living organism, not an organization. We belong to a living organism. We are the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the believers that are called out from the world to stand out. This morning in, uh, in our Sunday school, we talked about Romans 12, 1 and 2, where Paul says, I beseech thee, brethren, by the mercies of God, or I argue with you, or I urge you, or I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He's worried about the presentation. We ought to present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. And then how? Holy. Holy means to be set apart. It means to come away from. Holy and then acceptable to who? Not the pastor, but acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God ain't asking us to do anything that's too hard for us or anything that's really out of the realm of possibilities for us to do. And that we what? Be not conform, that's to look like the world, but to be what? Transformed by what? The renewing of our what? How do you renew your mind? You gotta read the God's word. You can't read, you can't renew your mind just by reading some other books, by just by coming to church and listening to the preacher. You gotta renew your mind, read the word of God so that the word of God begins to read you. And meditate on the word of 
God, I couldn't sleep last night tossing and turning because I was concerned about today's message and listening to God's word and meditating on God's word. I had to leave last night a little early so I could get upstairs just to think about the message. And so, listen to this. In a covenant relationship, there are these things. The promise, yes, the purpose, and there's the protection. Now, the promise is in God's, when you're dealing with God in a covenant, there's always a promise. God said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to take care of you. Or whatever, there's, a, there's always a promise that you can look forward to. And then God has a purpose for his covenant. He has a purpose. All right? He has a purpose for the believer. The purpose is, is for us to help his kingdom come. Not that God needs us per se, but that's why he created us. All right? That's why he allowed us to stay. He created us to be in a love relationship with him. Okay? And in love, he's the only God, and he's the only God anyway, but no one else uh, religion, and we're not a religion, but a relationship. But no other religion even has a God that renders mercy. You got to work to get yourself right in those religions. But in our relationship with Jesus Christ, which has a witness, we don't have to work. The finished work has already been done on Calvary. When Jesus was lifted up upon the earth, and the Bible says, I, I'll draw all men unto me. If I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And Jesus was lifted up on Calvary. And men and women are still coming to know Jesus Christ. And so what is our purpose? Our purpose is to love God and to live a life that will draw others to Christ. Because the reality is, is that people are going to die. The reality is all of us are going to die. Yes, and, the, and the reality to that is, is that some people are going to die outside of Christ, unfortunately, and go to hell. And so what Jesus does is offers us a plan, a security plan, yeah, that will get us into heaven before his father. Why? Because he's got the relationship with his father. A lot of folks think it's works. I'll be on the usher board. I'll be a preacher on the deacon board. I'll be whatever. It's not that. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says this, that no one can get to the Father lest they come by me. That's acknowledging that Jesus is Savior. He is King. He has every attribute of the Father. He has the ability to save us. He has the ability to keep us from falling. He has the ability to take us and to transform us. But then the protection is that commitment. The protection, see, once we're in this relationship, we're committed to living for Christ. And Christ protects us. The Word of God keeps us from sin. It keeps us from the danger of sin and the harm of sin. And what we got to do is every day, because sin is there every day, right? It's present every day. So what we got to do is read the Word of God every day to keep that sin away from us, to keep the temptation away from us, lest we forget. You must know, so cuss everybody out. God, because you saved me. 
and because you love me even before I can even love myself. Because you provided for me. You're full of, and your grace is full of, of forgiveness and love and mercy and protection. And because of that, I want to give that a portion of what you've given to me. Isn't that a good guy? He ain't asking for it all. He's asking for a portion. And most of us, we are trying to get it on, trying to make it on our own, but we can't get it because our relationship is not right with God. So the question is, I want to ask this question. Are you in a covenant relationship with God or a convenient relationship with God? That's what I said to him in Sunday school this morning. When you're in a covenant relationship, you love God. You say, Lord, I trust you for everything that I have. I trust you for everything that I need. When you're in a convenient relationship, you're saying, God, I only come to you when I need something. God, I need something today. I need you to help me. I need you to get me out of this. But then you continue to live the way you've been living. Outside of the word of God. A convenient relationship says, you, God, exist for me. You're my personal genie. You show up when I need you to show up. It's a selfish and individualistic thought process. But a covenant relationship says, I exist for you. I am a servant for the kingdom. I am a slave. I exist for the purpose of my master. And what my master says, I'll do. Yes. Now, a lot of us, we don't want to say that. But look at what it does. It puts us in a position where we say we're better than Jesus. Because in the book of John, Jesus says that I come to do the will of my Father. What my Father does, I do. In other words, he says, I exist for the Father. But if Jesus can say that he exists for the Father, and you and I say we can't exist for the Father, we're saying that we're better than Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient unto God, a servant, and became obedient even to the death of the cross. How about that here for today? The Macedonians in this scripture, when you read it in its entirety, could give out of their poverty because they understood, understood what it meant to be in a covenant relationship. Paul's talking to the church of Corinth, and he's talking about the Macedonians, and he said, they've given out of their poverty. Poor folks. Because they understand what a covenant relationship is. There was no limit in what they could do and would do for the Lord. Because they love Jesus that much. They love the Lord that much. The question is, what about us? Is there a limit in what we would give? Right now, the Lord had compassion on us. He cooled the, he cooled the sun down. The rain. But y'all can tell there's something wrong with the AC. Are we the kind of people that say, you know, we got we want you in our for our convenience. We want you to make everything right for us. God says, I will. When you understand that you're in a covenant relationship with me. When you understand that there's a purpose for your life, and it's not just to exist for Sunday mornings, but it's ministry. What are you doing for ministry? Who's griping about ministry? Who's griping about missions work? Who's griping about the word of God? If you stop those things, guess what? And understand that you're in a covenant relationship with me. I'll start to let the sun shine on you in the way that you want it to be shining. I'll start to give you the blessings that you need. God is the giver of life. He is the sustainer of life. And because of that, we should give to him. We should love him enough to say, God, for you I will live and for you I will die. You've given me everything that I have. What do you have today? 
that you had already? How, what, what do you have in your possession that you've had and you got it on your own? What do you have in your possessions that you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps? Most of us didn't even have sense enough to know that we had boots on. Let alone to try to pull up our own straps. Come on, somebody. It's all because of God, the sustainer of life, the alpha and the omega. Well, I wish I had the strength in me to do it the way I really want to do it. The first and the last. The, 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 the sustainer, he's eternal. He's pre-existent. He's self-existent. He's Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. He's Jehovah Shalom. He is the God of peace. He is Jehovah Tiskanu. The God of our righteousness. He is El Elyon. He is the God of the universe. And everything I have. Let's go. 
So, brother, we, um, we, today we're getting ready to um, pass the tickets out and have the right hand of fellowship for those who have gone through an orientation class. So, we have an orientation, new members' orientation, we're going to take you through. And after that, we'll be the right hand of fellowship. All right? And you have all the rights and privileges of all the membership here at ICON. All right?
this table. As we commemorate the Lord's death, his body, his resurrection, we must first of all make sure that we come before this table clean. So we urge you to take the time, take a moment to talk to the Lord, confess any sins that you might have, anything that you might have against others, repent of, any grudges you might be holding, repent. Our horizontal relationship has to be right, along with our vertical relationship. And so we're going to give you a moment to do that. So if everybody would bow their heads and close their eyes, talk to the Lord for a moment about you and only you personally.
wine which he drank with the bread and said, This is my body, and eat all of it. And he took the cup, the cup of the New Testament, it's my blood that was shed for you, Jake, and drank all of it. And when they had finished, they went out the mountain.